better. Now, this is an inward marker for us that can sort of take on the subway section in here. And this is the final picture I looked at. This will show the importance of lighting in this picture. So this is the final picture that you see on the screen. And this is how the lighting work looks in this one. So it's really most of the detail we're getting actually coming from the lighting. And I think it's quite remarkable about how efficient it is here. So it's the lighting combined with the normal maps on the surface. The normal maps are rendered into the, into the G-part, but that's what contribute tremendously to this picture. And another picture, another example also from uh, uh, Operation Metro is uh, further out on the, on, on the actual software here. Here we have the fewer diffuse lighting that we're rendering out. We have a whole bunch of different types of light sources. So up on, up on, the, on the roof here, I have uh, uh, line lights, which are sort of these long cylindrical light sources that are lighting up the environment. Uh, we have a lot of flexibility in the light sources that we use. But you also see that there's, like, there's almost like there's light everywhere a little bit in the scene, and that's our, our radiosity solution that's been calculated to bounce around this light in the environment here to light up everything so it sort of fits together um, which looks really good. So this is the diffuse lighting. We also have a specular lighting pass uh, that's done at the same time of, of calculating the more direct reflection of the lights, which is used by a couple of multiple methods here. Uh, some light sources uh, affect the specular, some don't, we have environment maps and multiple methods. So this diffuse and the specular are really rendered at the same time and, and then combined to a single final picture where you both have the diffuse lighting, you have the specular lighting, and you have the, the colors and everything from, from, from the deeper as well to get this final picture, um, which looks really quite interesting. Um, another very important uh, component here, I mentioned a little bit about the radiosity, and we also call it indirect lighting, uh, is that uh, it adds a lot. And the right screenshot you have, uh, uh, this is part, part of Operation Firestorm, that's uh, an area where we disable the indirect lighting and we're in the the calculation. This is sort of what we have in, in my company too. We can make great games without having uh, bounce lighting and having nothing fancy shades there, but uh, if you tweak it properly and you have a color of darkness, but uh, the, the left screenshot with actually indirect lighting, the radiosity the calculation we've done, adds so much more, so much visual, more visual fidelity and sort of uh, the softness of the lighting in this environment that we really, really like. Um, this is another screenshot from the level that really shows the difference. We uh, uh, have surfaces here, some portions of this, of this scene that are almost completely dark uh, without the indirect lighting. But when, when we add that, they can be just as bright as they are on the, on the sunny side of the building. Because the, the sunlight has bounced around in this building. Uh, which looks good. Uh, and the final thing about lighting, we also have uh, spotlight shadows. We also have multiple types of light sources, spotlights, and line lights, and lights, and our spotlights, they can have uh, shadows for quite uh, dramatic effects in the middle of the world. So, yep, on to the third topic of our, the, the, the five graphical components I was mentioning, this, which is effects. Uh, effects has always been really a big topic in Belgium because there are so many vehicles and so many different types of stuff happening in the game. We can't just script uh, everything in multiplayer of, oh yeah, here should be a giant explosion. It needs to be stuff that, that just work out of the box. Uh, and uh, stuff, different types of effects that interact with the environment and that, uh, that really are dynamic and, and really interesting in nature. Um, so, typically our effects are built up by uh, thousands of both really small as well as really big particles. And we have those sprite particles, which are just uh, pretty much just a plot being, being rendered with a texture line, as well as mesh particles, which are real meshes uh, mm -hmm. that are in the environment. Uh, and we use a little bit of different types of stuff there. And one, one key thing that we found out when working with our effects is that it, the most important thing with effects is that it's not just the individual look of a specific effect and what we in isolation. The most important thing with effect is that it fits into the environment. That it interacts with the thin of the things in the environment. Um, and a big portion of this is lighting. Most games just use a uh, single texture by their particles that they fly around there. And it can be okay if it's a pretty static game or pretty static lighting environment. But with our talk about interaction with our environments, we found that adding proper lighting to our effects in our particles is a lot. So it's all about the lighting again. Um, so here's a, another particle screenshot of uh, that you're running through this time, just shooting it around. Got a little bit, a little bit of a small cloud there. Uh, it doesn't look super remarkable, but it, it has got a lot of interesting components here. Uh, first of all, you don't see a hard intersection uh, between the particles and the terrain here. It's just soft and sort of just fits in. That's what we call soft particles. We do a soft play between particle and the, the terrain instead of a 
form of sleep testing, which is more visual than what the looks in the really bad actually. And because the particles you're rendering, even though they're just sprites, they're supposed to be a volumetric effect that you're rendering. So any type of hard artifact in them, uh, clipping and scrolling was really bad. And we're also combining in with some, some other particles here that are just apple testing. So they actually have hard images on them, but they're small the details, just quick and small. And this picture looks kind of weird with just three different clusters of alpha uh, distance degree. But in motion, this looks really good for uh, the way the interacts with something. It's a shock to this kind of thing. And one of the major innovations that we have here in an experiment with Cosmo 2 is, is to have particle shadows. So uh, this particle cloud here actually has a shadow on the ground. And this is something we have enabled by default from using the medium or higher shock shadow particle or something. Because we have a quite heavy view to render this, but it looks really well. I'll show some more pictures of that. Here are the giant uh, explosion things we have out here before. And here's particle shadows on. So just look at this picture. You can't really, well, it's a little bit difficult to tell where are particle shadows here. Uh, and that's a good thing. Because good particles, they actually fit into the environment. They just create this overall pleasing texture. You don't see what, don't see a single artifact that really stands out and looks weird. And say, oh, that looks wrong. They don't have that. Uh, it's, it's just it's together. But if it is able shadows, then you actually see a pretty major difference. I also have a, I have a movie here, of course. Uh, I recorded the mouse here, uh, So here's the also in motion, uh, and here's the tables uh, of, of how the particles can sort of give life to the shadows in the world. Uh, this is being played out on the map, so I can kind of make it for this. Another aspect of uh, particles and the effects in general is that is lighting batched particles. So that very, I, don't, well, I don't know how many days to do this except for us now, is that we have a volumetric uh, lighting system for our particles. So every particle we have in the environment can be lit by a volume of the light sources that we have in the environment. And this really creates a kind of super interesting visuals, I think, of, of uh, it really fits in the particles. You have a small muscle flash there, and it's just subtly, it has a very subtle, subtle effect of just lighting up the particles around it because we have put a lot of type of mist particles around this environment. And here we have a big, um, um, oh, a big mortar, uh, you know, a tire on it, uh, pulling down and lighting up the environment around it. Uh, and here's just some small of these balls. This, this is also just a kind of zoom into mix our lighting and our particles fit in together. It's really automatic thing that was actively implemented all the code. Uh, it just it kind of screens particles and ends up lighting more and more things to work. And it looks really cool in motion. So, so uh, that just as these particles can uh, receive light, they can also uh, cast light. So we have uh, light sources on our on some of our particles, not in that one, but we did the visible that, but on some of the other ones. So uh, you can see here the entire tunnel here has been lit up by uh, particles from the fire. The, the, the smaller fire up close uh, also has uh, this lighting up the environment around it. So there's also another aspect of this environment to get this. Uh, so here's an example of the part of the lighting that is pretty sweet in motion. Where you have this, uh, these giant sand missiles going up and just lighting up their own smoke clouds uh, behind them. I'm really proud of those like, uh, visuals and the effects of So this is just a work. The artist just plays the light source and the end. So uh, all of these that are attempts that happen during gameplay also just playing game and having some big smoke cloud going up from a from a tank to a using smoke or some smoke or something like that and then there's a explosion going off and everyone. Perhaps it's not as bit spectacular as this event, but this is the only game. Oh shit. Uh, let's see. That was awesome. Then there's all small aspect of lighting. Now we have light sources that can cast light, they can receive light, and they can cast a shadow. We also have it's also a traditional problem in many games that the light sources don't receive shadows on top. So you have a big, you have this strong sun lighting up the particle. It's pretty easy to do, but then you also have areas of the scene, that, especially in urban environments, that come to be super important, that's not in uh, that need to be the particle is able to be shadowed from the sun also. So uh, we've done this a long time actually in Frostbite, and this was not part of these two, but we wanted to find a virtual of, uh, of, of casting a shadow on all the particles. It's very apparent in many of the urban environments. If, if I were to just have shown you the picture in motion and play here, you wouldn't have seen it that much, but uh, you would, yeah, well, if I showed you the upper screen, you wouldn't have seen what, what's different about this. But when you disable the effect, it doesn't fit in at all. Here's a, you put everything together. These are the things that I 
Okay. Good to work on the Another big aspect of uh, all of the Dazzle games for us that we always have large scale trees. Um, and we're kind of returning back to that the major heritage of uh, you know, the of all, which is having a large scale of the MBCQ. So we have really quite advanced view business on them. And not all landscapes, but many other landscapes on the world. It's like operations are still not really over here. And this is uh, made up by a couple of these important components here. First of all, the memory, the memory requirements for having a giant race is actually quite, can require a lot of memory, both for the high fields, but also for the textures, the normal maps, and, and all the type of detail they want to put in there. So we have got a, a sort of hierarchical streaming system for our terrain, so you can seamlessly just move over the terrain and it streams in higher details so it's closer to the geographies, because you can't see all the detail in the distance. But at the same time as we did that, we really wanted to be able to see all these small type of, of of the um, well, mountains and detail in the distance of the train, uh, and both, both on the actual solar to the train, but also inside the train. And we did this, uh, we implemented this by using uh, sort of pixel normal maps. So we have this very high resolution high pixel so that we can load in that we uh, convert over to, to normal maps uh, to be able to light them at the pixel level correctly. So that's why you still see all of the detail inside the, uh, inside the mountains or uh, on the sides of them. Um, but we found that. Well, with the exam we can go even further there, so we have to support for those desolation and displacement mapping, so it sort of goes hand in hand with our terrain. It's really nice and fit, fit in very nicely in our operation with further detail on our terrain to keep our solar to us. So, just another 10 minute screenshot there, it was zoom in a little bit farther, where you can see that. So, well, you see a lot of detail there in general, but if you zoom in on it, so this, so this is how it looks like when you're using the standard normal mapping. So let's look at this screenshot, it looks pretty good, but it looks actually, well, the internals of the terrain look really good. Uh, but silhouettes, we don't really have that many triangles to be able to keep correct silhouettes everywhere, especially when moving around the land to those environments. So the silhouettes are a little bit uh, lower as here. But then when we have the space map instead, we, we, we try and we really keep this, uh, these high resolution high to keep the full detail we have on the edges here. And, and this is something we, we can only do on this level, because we're in the terrain now with, instead of running with 100,000 triangles or something like that, we're in with a million triangles. Uh, good performance, uh, actually. It's pretty good <laughs> with all the default and GPS. Uh, so, this is enabled with the train focus setting in there. Uh, when you set it to high or you set it to ultra, it, it's not really apparent on all levels, though. Like, if you're in metro, even if you display my thing there, it doesn't really matter because it's just a flat park area. But it's just like a non tennis block. Just to clarify, is that tessellation? That's the split mapping, yes. Tessellation and the split mapping. Another really uh, important aspect of terrain is not just the geometry. If you have a lot of geometry, if you have a million titles on the terrain, it doesn't really look like a terrain. You need good textures on the terrain. You need a good way of shaping it and rendering the terrain. So, with the that everything. Called, uh, I said that everything. Texture, oh, it's it's a, which is a method of uh, combining tons of different types of textures and many, many layers of the terrain uh, sort of in a semi procedural fashion. Of, across our terrain and render them into a virtual texture. This is not, not really the same thing as the, 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 the mega texture, because they just load giant textures. Here is that generating these textures uh, in game. So there's different pros and cons with both of these approaches. Uh, but the reason why, why, why we chose this approach is that, uh, well, first of all, we don't have that huge storage of just having static textures. And at the same time, we have a lot of dynamics that are going on in game. We have dynamic construction on the high fields. You can destroy the landscape as a we create creators dynamically and I played it though. to affect the, the texture of the train. Uh, and this is also in general action optimization because we can uh, take instead of rendering for every pixel, rendering ten no. different layers of the train no. and well, inside the shape and just combining multiple pictures and multiple type like, of yeah. noise functions and, and, and uh, it. Uh, orchestrated effects in order to create different materials. We can just do that once and then render it into uh, a texture and then reuse that texture. Not we use it for the entire game, but we use it for perhaps a hundred times. So we save a lot of performance there with this method also. And, and it enables us to not even know what you this is that we're keeping this uh, default. It's not just default texture that's happening only up close and then it's just a column map, which is what we did in BFQ. And here you can actually see the tiles that we're running in the train. This is seamless in the actual game, this is just a 
visualization to see that there's different resolutions. Up close, it's high resolution, and in the distance, it's low resolution. But in practice, you should not see this in the average. Yeah. Um, and this is also effectable with the three points that are again, where you on all travel, you just crank this up a lot more and low, you just keep it there. Keep it there. Can we upload it in like pretty large, low, probably? But it's still looks pretty so the, these tiles that we're going to do are really nice, 256 by 256 uh, tiny pictures uh, that we generate out when, when, once you move closer to an area, we split it up and generate out high resolution pictures, uh, well, we have more tiles there. And then we also compress them in real time to the DXD5, which saves uh, quite a bit of memory, so we store them out in DXD5 instead of counting those pictures. So we let the GPU compress them. And here's a, sort of a, a big atlas of all of these sort of uh, ram half random mess of the small picture files that we store in the giant picture that we didn't use later on. Uh, the left one is, I think, is the high field, and the middle one is the color map they see here, sort of matches the color. And the green one is very difficult to see here, but it's, it's, the, it's the normal maps in the train that we cache out because we have a lot of normal detail that we just call this one. Another thing about our training really landscapes is that uh, just having good geometry and good picturing is still not enough. You, you need a lot of uh, geometric detail up close, uh, having small shrubs and bushes and, 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 and grass and things like that. Uh, this type of area in, in the south -town. So we have a system uh, that we've had for quite a while in our games, but we've improved it quite significantly here to work with this proceeding virtual texturing and work with our landscape systems. Uh, it's something we call terrain decoration, which is the dark grass of this. And that's actually, this is not meshes or off standard objects that we place on the level. This is something we procedurally generate as you're moving across the level, seamlessly. So if we would save out all of these in this level, I, I haven't done any calculations, but you probably take, yeah, I don't know, 10 gigabytes of storage or something, just saving all those instances uh, of objects that we Instead, we procedurally generate it as moving over the terrain seamlessly, and we fade it seamlessly. So it's a highly scalable system, uh, and it's based on the exact materials we have in the train. So you can see some, some uh, uh, areas of the uh, uh, foliage here are sort of missing. It doesn't have anything, but it's a different material on the ground. So that's sort of easy. It fits together for us, and that's a lot of detail, and very easy for us to create an atlas to what is the atlas to create what is. So here we have some, uh, an example of a, uh, this is the Caspian border, actually. Um, an example of how it looks like the train decoration off. This is actually, you can't play the game like this because we don't, we don't allow you to turn off these effects because it would be too, too easy to see everyone hanging in the grass and stuff. But, but this is how it looks like it. Yeah, like and here we add the, on the lowest detail of the mesh gap here, uh, on the uh, train decorations. We add a lot of grass, some, uh, uh, some smaller bushes, and some flowers there also. And it looks like it's a much more pleasing picture than this one. But then we have this pretty skill box. We have the other detail that is also. So here's medium detail, here's high detail, and here's ultra detail. So uh, I can go back and also. So you see it sort of adds, it adds a little bit of close, that's a little bit more close, so close and the distance is that's a little bit more less. So it's quite scalable, it's a little bit of balance, we don't want to have it scale too much, uh, because then it would be too easy to cheat by seeing the pro and the grass. It's a little bit of balance, but I think it works really quite nicely. And here's the difference between ultra and low. Okay, so the final graphical component uh, that I was talking about for, for Game 3 is uh, post processing. Um, post processing is a really important tool for, for a developer. We have tons of different types of post processing effects. Uh, many of them are, are stuff that uh, enhance the gameplay or, or sort of indicates what game is going on. If you have a blur screen or a blur diagram that is tinted, you also know that's an effect going on. That's a lot of it. Uh, we have other effects like motion blur, which is a sense of speed in the environment, uh, as well as uh, even more important things like tone mapping and bloom, which uh, I talked about earlier, which actually is really part of the lighting and part of the HDR energy, but they're, they're must have uh, analysis. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of these effects that we have. So, first, immune pollution. Uh, immune pollution is the it's a full screen uh, effect that uh, makes, it, makes the, all the objects uh, fills up the it's an important vision cube that uh, is grounded in the world. Uh, so, uh, so this is a cheap version of the inclusion that we've added for Frostbite 2 for people with a little bit lower end uh, graphics cards, uh, which is standard as a 